Well, this is the ray tracing lab. Hmm. Uh, ray tracing is usually done in the dark, so it's a fun lab to do. I'm going to be in the dark quite a bit. Uh, and I'll try and do this now. I'm not going to do it with the equipment the lab manual specifies. This equipment is different. I need the equipment to be up on the board, whereas the lab was written for the equipment to be on the table. And you take a pencil and draw lines on the table. Well, I'm going to draw the lines for you. Uh, just to let you know where ray tracing is, in, uh, if you're in the Physics 101 L course, the uh, ray tracing lab is on page 119 in the lab manual, but the part we're interested in actually starts on page 124 of the lab manual. If you're in Physics 102, I believe the lab starts on page 96, and the part we're really interested in starts on page 100. The reason I say the part we're really interested in, we're interested in the pages where you actually draw, would draw something. Well, I'm going to do the drawing for you. You don't have to draw it necessarily on your paper exactly the same. You know, getting meat rulers and measuring and protractors and everything. You're going to do a freehand sketch. That's not what we do in the lab. If you were to do it here. But uh, you can do it freehand. The big thing is the values. When I measure a value, I want you to write it down. So, oh, I'm sorry, physics, physical science 103. I don't know what page the ray tracing starts on in that lab manual. Hmm. But uh, Physics 103 has the Physical Science 103 also has this lab in their lab manual. Um, so we're, when it, what you're going to do is starting on the pages where they actually expect you to draw something. Uh, you're going to take and draw a rough sketch. When we do this for real, the, some of the sketches go off the edge of the paper, so students have to take and tape pages onto the sides of the paper to extend so they had enough space to draw. I have a whole marker board, so I have it easy. I can draw as large as I want. Um, and so we don't have to tape pages together and such. Um, so you're going to take and draw a freehand drawing, roughly like it. And uh, you're going to take and uh, draw, you're going to write down whatever I measure. Links in centimeters, angles and degrees. And uh, index refraction has no units because it's a speed divided by a speed, the units cancel away. For those of you in 101 L, in, lecture, in the 101 lecture, a lot of the topics this lab uses are optional topics for lecture. The instructor uh, gets to decide how deep the, the instructor wants to go. So for 101 L, I put a, I'm gonna email a document out that you really don't need to do this lab, but if you really wanna know what's going on, you might want to read it because it talks a bit about the theory. Physics 102, whatever your lecture instructor wants to do. Uh, uh, I think, phys well, what I'm saying, in, physics, in 102 lecture, they did go into this, I think, quite a bit. I think. Yeah, phys uh, physical Science 103, your lecture instructor will tell you what they want you to know. Uh, maybe they'll take the document I have and use it or something. Well, um, so here's the thing. We're dealing with refraction and reflection here. We're going to see a bit of the, uh, uh, two laws. We're going to see one law. We're going to see Snell's law of refraction. We're going to see uh, reflections, how they work. We're going to see real and virtual images. And that's the concentration of this lab, is real and virtual images. Hmm. And so uh, for 101L students, the document I email out describes it. And I'm going to show you on the board uh, what, what uh, when during the experiment, we'll do virtual images first, I'll show you that. And then I'll show you a, uh, a real image. A lot more discussion of it in lecture or in uh, case 101L, the document I email out. Okay, so let's start by having a plain mirror and seeing a virtual image in a plain mirror. Okay, for the first part, we have a, a laser source here. And a mirror here on this blue line, I have a mirror right there. Right here there's a little red dot. I put arrows there to point at it because it's hard to see. Uh, what you're going to be doing is, that is going to be the object we're going to use. And we're going to use this mirror to form a virtual image. Hmm. And so the image will look like, it, like the object is actually there. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, if I take and hold this pen up, the reason people can see the pen, any point of the pen, suppose this point right here on the pen, uh, is because light shines on the pen, 
and it reflects this way, that way, that way, that way, just about every way. It just reflects all the way out, different directions. And so it appears that that, uh, that point of the pen is right there because the rays are coming out from it, reflecting off of it. And so therefore you can see that point of the pen, or maybe you can see this point down here, the same thing. Light reflects off of in different directions. Well, what we can do with optics, we can take and make it so the rays appear to be coming from somewhere else. Maybe they really are. And we'll actually have, um, and that's how we form an image. But there's a difference between a virtual and a real image. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take and show you a virtual image with a plain mirror, sort of like your bathroom mirror you have at home. Except for one thing, in this lab, we're pretending we have a two-dimensional universe. So the mirror, I keep saying mirror, a mirror, <laughs> the mirror here is, is, uh, is not sticking out from the board very much. We're, so we're having like a two-dimensional universe here on a flat marker board. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna, so I zoom back a bit, now it's harder to see the red dot. Uh, but uh, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn the laser on, and first we're gonna shine the laser beam straight into the mirror, so it reflects back along the same line where it went in. Again, I said mirror, didn't I? Mirror. Okay. My pronunciation from when I was a kid still sticks. Uh, the, mir the mirror here <laughs> is gonna reflect the beam straight back the way it came. Uh, I'll turn the laser on, but you won't be able to see it until I turn the room lights off. So now I'm going to turn the room lights off so you can actually see what I'm talking about. The watch screen, you see the, the mir mirror, the laser, there's a dot right there. I'm shining it past. That dot's going to be like an object, but I'm going to take and do this. And now you can see that red laser beam going across the board. It's hitting the mirror, reflecting right back. You can't even see the reflected beam because it's right on, the, on, the, on top of the incident beam. Hmm. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take and draw that line. Now, in the lab manual, they wanted you to take and do it by using a straight edge. Um, my straight edge kind of long, I don't want to get it in here, so I'm going to do it this way, I can do it this way. i got a little straight edge. Okay, so I'm going to use this little straight edge here to try and get it like you would do in lab. A little longer. Okay. So there's that black line that represents that incident ray going in. The light bouncing back, we say a reflected ray coming back, they're on the same line. So now I'm going to do, is I'm going to take my laser, I'm going to leave the mirror where it is. I'm going to take my laser and put it at a different angle so that it will go through. It's having a little trouble adjusting the laser. The laser has a, an adjustment on it that I want, making it hard. Okay. I am really trying, oh I see that would happen. The magnet fell off. Okay. What did I do? Is it record it's recording, right? Okay. What did I do? Well I adjusted the laser so it's coming down at an angle like this. And now when it hits the mirror there is a reflective beam coming this way. You can't see it yet so much when the lights out. Now you can see it. Here's the reflected beam coming in. I mean, reflected. the incident beam coming in nice and bright. Down here, the reflected beam coming down below. Hmm. And so you actually have, now you can, the incident beam and the reflected beam can be seen separately. Let me turn the lights back on. I do, when, I, when I turn the lights back on, the trouble is, is that the, uh, it's hard to see the beams now. I can see them. But it's kind of hard on your video, especially when it's a red beam. Hmm. So now, I want to take and draw in the incident beam 
and the reflected beam. So I'm going to do that. The incident beam is right there. Okay, reflected beam. I'm gonna, I can see it, it's kind of hard for you to see it. Okay. Now, in your book, we would take uh, and put arrows on here to show the direction of the beam. So I'll just do that. Your textbooks, your textbooks do that, so I'll do that too. Sorry the sound is kind of poor in this video. Our sound system, the nice one we had, went down. And we're using a poor sound system now. Okay. Well, now I have two beams there. I'm gonna do a third one to, to illustrate a point. I'll just pick one, kind of at random. Now something you don't see too easily here, you know that red dot that I originally had there? I'm deliberately putting the beam over that same red dot. Why am I doing that? I'm trying to show that the reason you see an object is because when light shines on it, light shines in all the different directions and that's why you see an object there if you look with your eye. For this example of the pen, if any point of the pen you see because when light hits it, light reflects in all the different directions and so you see the blue cap of the pen there. Um, and uh, but this, it may not look too blue in the video, but it's, it is blue. <laughs> the, uh, and so I'm trying to make it so that the light is coming off this object <clears throat> and going to the mirror. Okay? Um, now let me turn the lights out again so you can see the reflected ray and the incident ray. Here's the ref incident ray, here's the reflected ray up top, and I want to draw those in. Hmm. Let's see how that works. I don't know if I drew that one very well. Did I do it? Yeah, it looks like it's pretty good. We'll see. If I did, we'll have a little mess in the future. <laughs> All right. Well, now there's something we're going to do here with the lights on. We'll maybe check with the lights off to make sure I drew everything right. Now, I didn't draw that line very well, did I? Okay. The black line is above the red line. Hmm. You try it again. Take my little black line here out. We'll try that again.
That's better. So now, if I take, uh, take the mirror off, there's a, reason, <coughs> there's a reason I'm doing this. The blue line shows where the mirror plane was. I want to see where the image forms. Well, these lines, these rays, are all diverging like this. They're up that way and down this way and one straight out. Huh, how am I going to see? How am I going to see where the image forms? Hmm. Well, the image should be like the object, that the, all the rays should appear to come from the image. They should appear to come from the image. So they should, in this case, how we do that, let me take the mirror away. So the mirror's out of there. And I'm going to turn the laser off a moment. Here's what we do. I'm going to take and extend, extend the lines of the reflected rays backwards to see what's happening here. So I'm going to take this. First ray I did was that one. Huh, this thing does not want to stay still. Okay, and I'm going to do something that you, I'm going to do something that your textbook does. It takes and makes it a dashed line. Why? To show that the light really didn't go that way. The light really didn't go there, but I'm going to extend the line backwards. Uh, let's try another one. <clears throat> let's try this one. Okay, let's try this one. I'm extending the rays backwards. Now look at that. The light did not really go back there. But look, all the rays here, this ray appears to be coming from there. The ray going this way appears to go from the same point. The ray here, if you look backwards, it looks like, it looks like it came from back there. That's an image, because all the rays appear to be coming from back there. The reflected rays, and all the reflected rays appear to be coming from that point. And so that point there is called a virtual, virtual image. of the original object, which is this point way over here. Again, it's called virtual because the light does not go there. For example, if you're at home <coughs> and you look in a plain mirror, now in your three-dimensional universe, this is like a two-dimensional universe we're dealing with here, you look in a plain mirror at home in your bathroom mirror, you see yourself, you see an image of yourself, but it appears to be in another room through the wall. That's your image. But the light does not really go into the room behind you to form that image. So it's called a virtual image. Okay? Whereas in a real image, the light would really go there to where the image is to form the image. Hmm. Can I make a real image? Let me see where I am. Well, before it does get to real, real images, the lab manual wants us to take another look at this, ref uh, uh, now we saw reflection, uh, the, uh, they want us to look at refraction. Before I leave reflection, I want you to notice something. Did you, if you took a line, I'm going to do it freehand here. I'm not going to use a straight edge, but I'm just going to show you this. It's not part of the lab necessarily, but I want you to know it. If I took a, a, a line perpendicular to that plane of the mirror, 
they call it a normal line because it's perpendicular to the surface that did the refraction or reflection, whatever it was. So I'm going to draw. Do you notice the angle on both sides of that line for the incident ray and the reflected ray are the same measure? Look at this one up here. See how the normal, normal line bisects this big angle here? So if the angle of, for the, incident, the reflected ray is the same as the angle of the incident ray from the normal line. We measure the angles by tradition from the normal line. It makes sense. Our equations are easier to write if we do that. So instead of measuring from the plane, we measure from the uh, line perpendicular to the surface. Hmm. Okay, that will kind of matter in a bit because we're going to talk about Snell's law before we actually form more images. I had to redo it. And the reason I had to redo it was because I started letting the board get erased before I had my measurements down. Okay, so this is the mirror put back on, did a few rays, and uh, I don't know what that was there for. Oh, that's a mistake. <laughs> but uh, if you raise, and here's the image point. And the object, of course, this is the second time I've done it, is about 14 and a half, 14 and a half centimeters away from the, where the mirror plane is. And the image is about 14 and a half centimeters from where the, in, the, the plane of the mirror was. Hey, 14 and a half centimeters both sides. Actually, my drawing is so crude. I bet if you were in here with your good eyes, you'd probably get down and say, this is 14.4 centimeters, and that's 14.6 centimeters, or something like that. Uh, I did this kind of in a hurry. So in your lab manual, uh, draw the first way I did it, uh, roughly, and then put down the measurements that the object was 14... 14.5 centimeters distance and the virtual image dis distance was 14.5 centimeters distance. Okay, so that takes care of the mirror section. We did a virtual image and we see that the virtual image and the plane mirror is the same distance from the plane of the mirror as the object is. So when you look at yourself in a plane mirror in a bathroom, that other guy you see there, the image of yourself, is just as far away from the mirror as you are. Yeah, if it's a good plane mirror. Okay, what we're going to do next, before we go on and talk more about images, I want to, we got to take a talk about refraction. This is reflection, now we're going to do refraction. In your lab manual that has you do a trapezoidal prism, I'm going to use a rectangular prism. Okay, I'm going to use a rectangular prism here even though your lab manual says to do a trapezoidal prism. So on that page you'll see in your lab manual it actually shows a trapezoidal prism there with a beam coming in like I'm doing. I'm going to, I'm going to turn the lights out so you can see what's happening here. Now look at that. Now some of the light is reflected. I don't know if you can see in the video but there's a line up, up above the whole thing going toward the top of the board. That's reflected ray. But inside the, the rectangular prism, you can see it is actually being bent. This refraction refers to either the bending of light by this or the phenomenon that makes it bend, which is the slowing down of the light or speeding up of the light. Light goes fastest in vacuum. That's the fastest it ever goes. The light goes uh, slower than that in any kind of glass or air. Air is just slightly slower than it is in vacuum. Uh, very slightly slower uh, but in gases and things, but in liquids and solids, in, in diamond, oh good grief, the speed of light is less than half of what it is in vacuum in diamond. That's why diamonds are also brilliant too. The, the more the light slows down, the sharper this angle, you see it bends there inside the, the rectangular prism, and uh, so that, uh, and so that's why diamonds are so brilliant. They bend the light so much 
then it makes a very brilliant diamond. Uh, now you notice what happens though, there the, 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 the beam went into the prism and bent a certain way. When it gets to the other side of the prism, it bends back the same amount of measure of angle, the opposite way though, so it comes out going a straight horizontal line like it was before. Here's a horizontal line going in, it bends inside the prism, on the other side it comes out just going the same way it was, just shifted down now because of, uh, of what the prism did. Hmm. Okay, let's take a look at this now. It's a rectangular prism. Um, it does the same effect. And what I've got is a laser beam coming in, striking here, and we're going to see how light refracts inside the prism. To see that, I'm going to turn the lights out and you're going to take a look and see what I see. Here's the beam coming in, incident on the left. When it gets to the prism, look, it bends at a different angle. And then when it gets to the other end of the prism, it bends again. So it's going back the way, the direction it was going before, but it's shifted to one side. Or shifted up, some people might say. Well, well, what I draw on the board here, this big blue line up here, is right along the face of the prism. This dashed line here is a normal line. It's perpendicular to the surface. We measure all our angles from, from normal lines. Uh, I drew a normal line here where the incident light strikes the prism. I drew a normal line here, roughly where the beam comes out of the prism. And I can draw using a little straight edge, I can draw the incident beam like this. I'm going to, do, I'm going to draw a little differently. I'm going to use the protractor this time. Use this straight edge. How am I going to draw the part that's inside the prism. The prism is on top of it. Let's look at that again. Yeah, I want to draw that part inside there too. But the prism is on top. So, I have to do it this way. I drew the line here, I drew the line there. I'm going to take the prism and go off. And then I can take the straight edge and I can just connect these points where it went in and where it came out. Okay. Well, so here's the angles I want to measure. I want to measure the angle between the normal and there. I want to measure the angle between the normal and here. I can get a smaller protractor for that. And I'll measure the angle where it, it comes out. Let me try the angles on the outside first. Let's take a measure the angle here. Ah, I see a typo in the in lab manual. It says angle of incidence has a blank for it has an angle of incidence as a blank for it. The second one was supposed to be angle of reflection. I didn't notice that before. Oh, we'll have to fix that in a later edition of the lab manual. Uh, Physics 102, lab, that's 101L lab manual. Physics 102 lab manual probably has it right. Uh, physics. A uh, physical science 103 manual probably has it right. I'm guessing that it does. Okay, so I have to change that little typo in the 101L lab manual. The uh, angle for the incident angle measured from the normal here is about 40 degrees. Let me take a look at that, make sure it's right. Okay. All right. I need a smaller protractor. To measure this little angle here because it's so, small. and that's about 27 degrees.
I had to measure several times to make sure I was getting them right. And so now here's Snell's Law. There is a function called a sine. For those of you in 101L, you've forgotten what that is, what, that is, what the S-I-N-E function. In fat Bible formula, it's abbreviated very often sin. <laughs> So the idea is, Snell's Law says this. We're trying to measure something from a material called the index of refraction. And the index of refraction is a measure of how fast the light is going in the material. So the index of refraction, called N, is equal to the speed of light in vacuum, they could usually use a lowercase, a uh, small c to represent the speed of light in vacuum, divided by the speed that it's, the light goes in the material. Okay, so the index of refraction in the glass times the sine of the angle that's in the glass, measured from the normal, is equal to the index of refraction of the air times the sine of the angle that was in the air. Our calculator has a sin function, a sine function on it, abbreviated sin. So I'm going to take my calculator and want to use this, but, to, but, wait, no, but what is the index of refraction of the air? We're going to take it as being approximately one. We're going to take the approximation of the Index of refraction of air is actually slightly larger than one. But we're going to take it as being approximately one so that we can write this as the sine of the angle that's in the air. So we can say that the end of the glass, I say glass, this is probably really a plastic lint, uh, optics I'm using is approximately equal to the sine of the angle in the, that the light uh, goes from the normal when it's in the air divided by the sine of the angle when it's in the glass, the incident angle, ref refracted angle. sine of 40 degrees divided by the sine of 27 degrees and it comes out to be about 1.4 for this glass, well it's not glass, it's actually plastic but for the uh, material that uh, the optic is made out of hmm. okay so on your lab report put down the Angle of incidence is 40 degrees. For those of you in 101L, sorry that it had a typo. It said angle of incidence again. It meant angle of incidence. Uh, uh, it meant angle of refraction for the second time it said it. Put down, cross out incident on the second one and put refraction. And it's 27 degrees. Write that down. Where it says sine of the angle, um, let me tell you what they are. For 101L, I'm not even going to ask you to write that one down because you just put in the calculator, but just to make sure, uh, the 40 degrees, the sine of 40 degrees is 40 degrees is approximately uh, 0 0.643. The sine of 27 degrees is approximately 0 0.5, I'm sorry, 0 0.454. I put that there because in your lab manual it actually asks, what is the sign? Well, I don't know if you have a calculator. Well, those in 101L, I don't know if you have a calculator like this at home. Those of you 102 probably have a calculator. 
or if you use a spreadsheet or something. Watch out if you do a spreadsheet. It thinks your angles are in radians. You want angles and degrees. Okay. So what are we doing? So for on that one page there in the lab manual, we did reflection, where we measured the object distance and the image distance. So they're about the same. For refraction, we do try to use Snell's law to find out what the index of refraction was for this little uh, rectangular prism that we had here by using Snell's law. Okay. Well, this, this part, Snell's law, there's an approximation over there. Okay. That's all is one page of the lab thing. The other pages should go a little faster because we're going to start getting into images again. We'll have to slow down when we get to Tang's talking about critical angle. Hmm. Well, let's set that up now. And let's take him do this. Well, let's take a few optics and show another kind of image called a real image. Now remember, a virtual image, the light doesn't really go to the image to form it. You saw in the plane mirror, it just a, the rays just appeared to go away from a point that we call the image uh, of the object. The, the image was behind the mirror. The light didn't really go there, so it was a virtual image. Here we're going to take and form a real image this way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my object at infinity. How do you do that? Well, look at these rays. Do you notice these rays are all parallel? That's the way rays come from an object at infinity. Hmm. So I'm going to form an image uh, of that object at infinity by putting a lens there. Now we're in our, still in our two-dimensional universe, so this is a flat lens that's just on the board. I'll put it right here. And as you see, even with the lights on, you can see it. The rays all appear to come from right there. That's where the image is formed. Hmm. Let's do something here. Let me take that lens out for a moment. And I'm going to take and put a blue line roughly where it was. Now, in all our discussions in uh, Physics 101L, Physics 102, and Physical Science 103, we kind of assume the lenses aren't very thick. So I'm going to put this here, and you're going to say, well, what is the position of the lens? Is it the front edge, the back edge, or the center? Ah. Well, like I say, in these courses, we're going to assume the lens is so thin that it won't really matter. That lens looks kind of thick, so I'm going to take the place we measure the distances from as being from the center of the lens. Ah, good, pretty good approximation is this lens is symmetrical, so it, it, that's pretty good. We'll just take and measure our distances from the center of the lens. So I put the lens right on top of the line, so the line's at going through the center of the lens. We, let me take a look. Turn the light on again. You can see then the object at infinity is forming an image right here, a short distance from the lens. When you form an image at a point or in a plane, that point or plane is called an image point or an image plane. But if the object is at infinity, like we did with these parallel rays, that image point or image plane is also known as the focal point or focal plane of the, of the optical device, mm. this lens. So if you hear about focal point, that's what it's talking about, the image point where the object's out at infinity. Well, i got to measure that. The lab manual wants me to. Let's see. It says, shows that. It shows the parallel rays coming in. And it says the focal length as measured from the center of the lens. That's what it says on this page. So I'm going to take a, a ruler 
I'm going to measure the distance. I can get the lens out, out just while well, I bend it off. Let me take a measure from the blue line to there, and it is about 15 centimeters. 15 centimeters. That's the focal length of that lens. Uh, in, okay. So that's what that is. So I'm going to write that down. The focal length, some books use F for it, is 15 centimeters. That's very common for a lens. Now again, this is a flat lens because we're in a two-dimensional two -dimensional universe, but that's what we're doing. That's the focal length of that lens. Hmm. Let's do a different kind of lens. Now, oh, before I go any further, whoops, i got to say something. That image there, is that a real image or a virtual image? You notice the light really goes to that image to form it. It really does. The light, the rays come this way, they go through the point and out. So I put my eye right here and look at that object. And look, at this, not the object. look at the image. I will see the image being right there because the rays are coming out this way. Another nice thing about a real image is you can put a screen there and the image will form on the screen. So the images you see in th movie theaters where the projector is at the back of the room and they project the image on the screen at the front of the room, that is a real image they are projecting on the screen. Ah, uh, in the future theaters may have flat panel screens in the front of the room, there is no projector. This whole, this whole discussion may go away with modern technology. But right now we still have, in theaters, the images are projected from the projector at the back of the room to the screen in front of the audience at the other end of the room. And that's a real image formed on the screen. You can't form a, a, a virtual image on a screen because the light does not really go there to form the image. Ah! So that's the difference. So a plain mirror and the bathroom mirror, you see a virtual image of yourself. The light doesn't really go to the other room behind to form that image of you. Here, on a movie screen, you're putting a real image there. Now what if the screen wasn't there? I could actually stand over here to the right of the image and actually see the image with my eye without a screen. But in a movie theater, they want everybody to see it, so they put a screen there and the image forms on the screen. To give you an idea, you can take a magnifying glass like this, ordinary lens like this in our three-dimensional universe here, and you can actually form an image. Look, there's the image of the room upside down on the board. I see the lights up there, they're upside down, so they're down here. You can try that. Take your room lights in your room, if you have a magnifying glass, and try and put an image of the lights on paper. Okay, I had to turn the board here, I put the image of the room's lights that are up there, they're upside down here in the image. That's a real image, because I was actually able to put it on the screen. Can you form a virtual image with a lens? Sure. Let me take that lens out. And I'm going to move my light source back a bit for this. You'll see why in just a moment. And I'm going to take a, uh, a diverging lens. This one is, is uh, concave on both sides. It's biconcave, they call the lens sometimes. And I'm going to stick it up here. On the blue line, hey, something's happening. Let's, let me let me see. If, can I get away with uh, moving it up a bit so it gets brighter? I might be able to. Let me see if I can do it. If I get it too close, I'll be able to do the measurement I want to do. Okay. Let's take a look with the lights off. Hopefully, that's on the screen there. And you see, look at this, here come the beams in parallel from the left of the lens. And look, they're diverging here. That's what they call a diverge, diverging lens. is because the, beam, the rays are going out like this. Well, that's not going to form a real image, but it does form a virtual image. Hmm. Let me take and try and draw those rays. Can I do it? Yeah, it's just bright enough so I can see it and do it. Um, I'm going to do it this way. Take this. Oh, 
Oops. Drew one there. Another one. Okay. This one. Draw this one. You may wonder why I'm drawing so many lines. I'm a terrible drawer, and I, even with a straight edge, I tend to get them off a bit. And so, hopefully with several of them, I'll get a decent result in just a moment. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the laser off. Take the optic out. And I'm going to try to extend those rays backwards using a nice long straight edge. That thing moved just then. Oh, it keeps moving. Every time I get to the end, it moves. Frustration experiment. Yeah, let's have to extend them longer. Ah, come on. Stop moving. Huh. Okay. I'm not, my drawing skills are really horrible, but here's the thing. It looks like it's going to come right up out here. You're supposed to extend it clear till the points come, the lines come together. And so it looks like it's about Twenty-six. And that's probably way off, but we'll take that for our experiment because I'm just a terrible drawer. Okay, yeah, it's hard to draw with a, on a marker board. This big long straight edge wants to move all over the place. Okay. Um, now, next thing it wants to do is try combinations of lenses. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take and... Okay, now, now look at this. I'm back to using a converging lens. It's biconvex. It's convex on both sides. But they want me to do something. They say, if you have an option infinity, and here's an image. Can you create an image of an image? I could do that by putting a lens out here and focusing this down maybe. 
well, there's going to be a virtual image if I do that. But what they want me to do is this trick, and this is actually done in your camera optics all the time. They form an image of an image, not by putting the next optic out here beyond the image. They'll take and put the thing like that. Huh. And then what they want to do is measure the image distance from, well, what we're doing, it, it, it tells in the lab manual, to measure from the center of the first lens to the image. See, but without that, the image is right there. With this thing, the image moves a little bit. Okay? And so they want to know the distance from the center of this one to there. And that is roughly 13 centimeters. So the focal length of that compound lens is 13 centimeters. What if I use a diverging lens there? Now remember the diverging lens had a, a focal length somewhere near 20 centimeters, wasn't well, it 26 or something like that? Uh, centimeters. So it, it's, it doesn't really diverge this all apart too well. So what happens there? Now the, now I have the, from the center of the first lens to the image is now 16 centimeters. Now, in all these examples of lenses, I keep doing the object distance out at infinity. Well, that's okay for now, but we're going to take, what about objects that are close to a lens? You know, you're a photographer and you take a picture of a mouse and stuff real close. Ah, okay, we'll see that in a bit. Before we do, though, the lab manual wants to do a little diversion, and it wants to go to uh, look at uh, a to uh, to uh, critical angle, which has a lot to do with total internal reflection. Let me show you the critical angle. Now here's the idea of this lens. It's called a D-shaped lens, or a D-lens. Well, I'll use a D-shaped lens, make it real clear. Um, <coughs> they have this curved surface here, so I can turn this thing and try and see what happens at a point there. I'm going to put a red dot there. I'm going to try to keep the center of the D, the center of the arc, right there at that red dot. We're not going to be concerned about what happens at this boundary here, where the beam goes from air into the, I keep saying glass, but it's actually plastic, okay? And into the material of the, of the lens. We're going to be concerned what happens at the boundary where it comes out. Well, you can see the beam goes in, it goes through, it comes out. Very plain when I turn the lights out. Mm. Okay. There you go. Um, but what we're going to look at is I'm going to turn this thing, and, we're gonna, and what happens, you'll see that there's two, besides the incident ray, there's two other rays. There's a reflected ray. Right now, the reflected ray is going right back toward the laser. And there's a, there's a refracted ray, which will come out here. And as I turn this thing, the refracted ray, instead of going straight, will actually bend. I want you to take a look, though, as we do this. The reflected ray is so faint, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it in the video at first. And then the refracted ray is bright right now. You, even with my room lights on, you can see it there. But it's going to start going dim. And the reflected beam is going to start getting brighter. How am I going to turn? I'll show you the room lights on what I'm doing, so that you know. I'm taking the thing, and I'm turning uh, the thing this way. 
Look, the refractive rate, rate is going up. Okay. And it's going further and further and further away from the normal. Okay. Now I'm going to do this with the room lights off because I want you to see what's going on with the rays. So put this back here. Turn the room lights off. Now it's hard, hard for me to see what I'm doing, but I'm going to take and turn this. Right now you can't see the reflected ray at all. It's going straight back to the laser. You can see the refracted ray. I'm going to turn this a bit. Okay. Now here's the, reflected, the refracted ray still here. You can't quite see it, but I can see it. Right here is, ref well there, you can put my finger there so you can see it. The reflected ray, it's so dim, I have to put my finger there to make it visible. Hmm. And look, the refracted ray has gone up a bit. It's not going flat out horizontal anymore. Let me turn this D some more. I'm trying to keep it at that dot if I can. It's hard to see the dot because it's in the dark here. Now look, the refracted green ray is going higher, and the reflected ray is getting brighter. I can actually see it here now. Huh. And then I turn further. Hey, look, the reflected ray is getting much brighter now. The refracted ray, you can't quite see it, it's getting dimmer. Let me turn the lights on for a moment. I want to make sure I see where I am. Kind of hard to see what I'm doing when, I'm, when the lights are all off. Where's that red dot? Oh, I covered it up. There you go. Okay. And what happens, I go further. Turn the lights off again. Look at that. The reflected beam is just about as bright as the refracted beam. You might not see it, but the refracted beam is actually getting dimmer. Watch what happens here. They keep the lights off. I'm going to turn this more. You notice the refractive beam is getting close to the to the face of the the face where the beam comes out. Let me show that to you. Make sure you see that. The beam, the refractive beam, is getting really close to this flat face here. Now, here's the thing: the index of refraction of this plastic here, this lens, is larger than the, pla the index of refraction in the air. The index refraction of the air is just a little bit larger than one. The index refraction of the plastic is probably about 1.4, I think we saw from one of the plastic pieces before. So what happens is by Snell's law, here's N of the, instead of saying glass, I'll say plastic, PL, <laughs> okay, times the sine of the angle that's in the plastic is equal to the Index of refraction of the air. Can you zoom out? Can you zoom that out just to be the equation? And times the sine of the angle in the air. Or just pan to it either way. So what so here's the Snell's law. Here's the plastic, index of refraction of the plastic times the sine of the angle inside the plastic. The index refraction of the air to the sine of the angle of the air. Again, these angles are measured from the normal to the surface. Well, N plastic here is larger than N air. Well, here's the thing. Again, those of you in physics 101L, I'm not expecting you to remember this. Those of you in 102 better remember this. And, uh, and also in Physical Science 103, you might have forgotten this too because your teacher only probably mentioned it once in high school, if at all. The sine has a maximum value. The sine cannot be greater than one. This function called a sine. But wait a second. If this is larger than this, this quantity on the left could be bigger than the index of refraction of the air, which is pretty close to one, just a little larger than one. But if this can't go over one, how can this equation hold if we continue to keep on increasing this angle here so this side here gets bigger and bigger? Something's going to happen. Something's going to break down. Hmm. 
There's a whole branch of mathematics called complex analysis that goes deeper into this. But we're just going to see what happens here. Let's go back over here and look at this thing. I'm going to turn the lights on again. So you see that D there? Yes. Oops. So if I keep on turning, what's going to happen is that refracted ray is going to collapse right against the face of the boundary. It's going to go right along the boundary. And when it does that, it, it gets dimmer, dimmer. Oh, look how dim it is. It's got dimmer, dimmer. It's gone. That's the critical angle when in that refracted beam is, is no more. The refract there is no refraction. The refracted beam is gone. The angle where that just happened is called the critical angle. And look, all the light is reflected. And that's called total internal reflection. If I go further, there's still no ref re refracted beam. It's just a reflected beam. And it's still total internal reflection. That is how the fiber optics work of your telephone conversations, your internet access, going across the ocean or across the United States, where you put all the communication through a fiber. I know there's also communication from microwaves and through satellites and all that stuff, but when they want a cable on the ground or under the ocean, they can use either copper, you know, elect electrical signals, they can use fiber optics, where a fiber actually uses this phenomenon of total internal reflection to keep the light inside the fiber so that the no, no light energy is lost. Ah, unfortunately, of course, scratches on the glass, dust, Things like that can actually interfere, and so some light will get lost. But in theory, look at that. No refractive beam. Make sure the light back on over here. But I've gone past the critical angles. There's no refraction here at all. The refractive beam collapsed right along this flat face here and dis at the critical angle and disappeared. And when I'm even further turning it, it's just gone. Huh. So that's what critical angle is about. Now, what they wanted you to do was measure what is a critical angle. So I got to take and bring the beam back. <laughs> Here's the refractive beam. I'm going to turn it till it just collapses on the edge. And now we're supposed to measure the angle there from horizontal. How do I? Uh, how I'm supposed to measure how far? Uh, um, this angle here is from the normal to this lens. Let's see, where's the normal? I think the triangle here. Figure out where the normal is. Hard for me to do with my, my hands keep nudging things, so it's kind of hard. This is right. Trying. Okay. There's that, and uh, let's see, and then I take the beam, let me pull the optical side for a bit, here's the incident beam, let me take that, draw that in, this is not the way the lab manual had you do it, but it's, it works just as well. And I want to take a protractor and try and measure the angle in here to see what the critical angle is. And it looks like it's, huh, 45 degrees. Is that right? Let me find out. I'm going to check that. Oh yeah, of course. So it is 45 degrees. So it looks like the critical angle there, 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 theta C is 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. Those of you in Physics 102 can use Snell's Law to find out, to check what the index of refraction of the plastic is from the critical angle. Did they have you do that in 101L? Nope. 101L, they don't have you do that. Physical Science 103, I don't think they have you do that. Physics 102, I think they want you to take the uh, critical angle there. Use Snell's Law to figure, remember?
for Snell's law, the theta in air was uh, 90 degrees. 90 degrees. This here is theta c, the critical angle. Use that. You take uh, the inexorable fraction of air to be just a, approximately one, and then you can figure out the inexorable fraction of the plastic. That's even more precise than the way I did it before. Physics 101L, Physical Science 103. Don't worry about that. They don't ask you. They don't ask you to do that in the lab manual. The reason I have to show this is because this that won't stay on the board. But I'm going to take and take a 45 degree prism. It's a prism that has a 90 degree angle here, 45 degrees angle here, 45 degree angle here. It's a little triangle, isosceles triangle, a right triangle, <laughs> 45, 45, 90 triangle, the engineers call these things. And uh, we're going to take and put it on the board so that the beam will come through this flat face here, hit the hypotenuse, and it reflects upward. What's interesting though is the transmitted beam, the refracted beam. Let's see it. There is none. There's no refracted beam. It's all reflected. So on that page, they wanted you to draw this. They wanted you to take and say, that the beam went in and reflected down. Well, that's not much of a measurement or anything. But then they ask you the discussion questions. Well, why was it no refracted beam? You just saw in the previous example with a D-shaped lens. If you go beyond the critical angle, or at the critical angle even, everything is totally internally reflected. For this kind of plastic, the critical angle was around 45 degrees. So, if the beam came in and struck at a 45 degree angle from the normal line, it's about the critical angle, the very verge of where total internal reflection happens. So, binoculars are made with things like this. Uh, instead of using mirrors, they sometimes use a 45, 45, 90, 45 degree, 45 degree, 90 degree angle prism and total internally reflect an image instead of using mirrors. Okay, now I can get back to real images and virtual images. So we're going to get back to lenses. But for now, we're going to stop doing the thing of uh, putting the object in infinity. That was fun because we found the focal lengths. But we're going to see what happens if the object is not in infinity. Oh, okay. So I'm going to leave this as being one ray coming out of this laser thing, instead of the several parallel rays. And I'm going to put, let's see, the first one says, do this. A, now, um, they want you to use a thing called the thin lens equation, which is given on the page. And they want to take a, a lens like this. They want to put an object way out here. and have rays go through the object to the lens. And they want to see where the image forms. Okay. We're going to take and take the laser beam and we're going to this whole unit and, uh, well, they draw, they draw, they take a, a, a beam going this way. Through that object point, they're right there. Make sure the lights out so you can see what's happening. So it's, the beam, instead of the beam's coming down, there is a reflected beam so faint you can barely see it. It's right there. Okay. Uh, but we don't care about it. There's the incident beam on the left. Here's a refracted beam on the right. I want to trace the refracted beam for a reason. 
we turn this back on. So I'm going to get my straight edge out, and I'm going to take, I have to get a long one because it's going to take some time, some space here. I'm going to get a black lock pin. Okay, I'm going to take and trace this. Ah! Bumped it. I'm going to trace this thing here. Okay, that's one refractive ray. I'm going to take the laser now and turn it over here. Whoops. And have it go that way through the lens. Again, it's going to rays going through the object. You've got to do that. Make it go through the object. And then let's see, lights off to see where the thing's going. Out to there. Oh man, I didn't draw the line long enough, it looks like. At least I can do something about that. Hold on a second. Look, like, can I go a little further? Let's see if I can go a little further. Not much. Let's see. Oh, well, that'll do. Okay. <clears throat> they want you to measure two lengths. The DO, which is the distance to the object, and DI, the distance to the image. So here's the object right here. Here's the image way out here where these points inter intersected. Boy, I just barely, I didn't quite, I should have drawn the lines even longer to make it more clear. Well, that's not even on the camera. Let me turn it this way. Let me zoom back a bit. Okay, there you can kind of see it. Okay. Uh, now I zoom back and actually see it. So I'm going to measure this distance. I'm going to use a meter stick, won't I? This isn't long enough, is it? Well, it's long enough for the first one. Um, from the object to the center of the lens is about 27 centimeters. Not long enough to get a meter stick. Sixty four centimeters for the image distance. And they give you an, an equation there where they want you to calculate the focal length of that lens. And that's called the thin lens equation. They call it the thin lens equation because they derived it assuming the lens is not really thick or, does, or it's, it's not like fairly flat on one side and really uh, bulky on the other side. Where, do you, where would the center of the lens be then? You see, you know, so they do a lot of it. They just say basically the lens is thin. Well, our lens isn't that thin, but it's, it's good enough. It's good enough approximation. We should be able to get it. A uh, quick trick for algebra there for physics 101L and such. Uh, that equation says this, 1 over d's O plus 1 over d image is equal to 1 over F. You can do a little algebra to rearrange that to be this. F focal length is d0 times di divided by d0 plus di. So the product divided by the sum, the sum will give you the focal length. Just a little algebra rearranges this equation to make that equation. Well, calculate it.
I gotta see it myself, I'm curious. Okay, so we have 27 times 64 divided by 27, in parentheses I do it, plus 64. You did that right, and I got somewhere close to 19 centimeters. You surprised me because I thought that was a 20 centimeter lens. Oh, but my drawing's not that great. <laughs> okay, so there you get the focal length there is around 19 centimeters. Yeah, do it yourself, see? Well, as long as we're doing this, let's do this thing with the objects. Um, where we get the, the let's get the object closer than what the focal length of the lens is. Hmm. I figured that the, that was about 19 centimeters, it's supposed to be 20 centimeters. I'll just take the lens and do this. And before we had a real image out here, because remember the light actually went out here and formed the image. Now what we're going to do <coughs> is we're going to move this so close that this is going to make a virtual image. Can it? I'll show you, it can. I'm going to have the incident ray go through the object to the lens. And let me turn the lights on so you can see what's happening. Yeah, that's not really converging, is that's converging lens. Look at that. The, here's the incident ray going up. Here's the refracted ray going out this way. It's not coming down like you might have thought it would have done. That's because you got the object so close to the lens. So now if I take and try and draw. this thing, the ray, to draw the ray that way, hmm. okay, and I'll take the beam and put, move it over this way, so I the magnet with it, there you go. Okay, just to see what it looks like. There you can see that this is there. Here's the ref refracted beam coming down here. I get my little my straight edge. I know something I forgot to do. I forgot to mark where the lens is. The lens is here. Okay. Now I'm going to take the lens out. <clears throat> Let me draw in the position where the lens was. take a measure to see where 
those lines going to cross. So I have to extend them. A long way to have to extend them. Huh. Extend that one. And the distance from where the lens was to the virtual object, notice the virtual object, is, uh, object sorry, the distance this time to the virtual image, notice the virtual image this time? Even though it was a converging lens, we just had the object so close that a virtual image formed back here. about 20 centimeters away. So down there where it says image distance, the image distance is 20 centimeters. Now I know some of you are using a textbook that says, shouldn't you put it down as minus 20 centimeters because it's behind the lens? This lab, we don't care about that. But uh, your textbooks may have a convention about that, about whether it's a positive or negative distance. Oh. Our distance in this lab are going to be positive. <clears throat> let's try a different lens. How about the diverging lens? It definitely will make a virtual image. So let's, where is that? There it is. We'll take and use it. Let me get these lines out of here. I'll keep the same object again, and I'll put the lens right on top of the blue line, and we'll take our, okay, just to show you what I'm doing there. So here's the incident ray. That diverging lens has such a long focal length, it doesn't bend the light very much, does it? Just a little bit. This is going to be a hard one to do. I cannot get the thing to stay still. Stay still, I draw. Okay. I'm doing this one now. You can see the beam. Again, like I say, it's a long focal length to this lens. The refraction effects aren't very strong to see. But they're there. And I think I can get this. Okay, I'm going to extend each line and see what the virtual image is going to form. Oh, we it moved. Okay, extend this one. Look, it wasn't very different, was it? Here's the object, here's the image. Wow. We're going to measure that little distance there. <clears throat> that is... Two and a half centimeters.
Okay, so you write that down on that page. Discussion questions. Let's see what we got. How do virtual and real images differ? What did I say? Does the light go where a virtual image is? Does the light go to form a real image? Yeah. Uh, you can also say in there, if you want to be more creative and make an essay out of it, you can say, boy, if real images form in movie theaters. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so don't, but be sure and say it's about where the light goes. <clears throat> Do you hear that? Uh, how can lenses be combined to make a stronger lens? The author of the lab manual said the stronger, nobody uses that terminology. What he meant was, how can you make it so that the focal length gets shorter? You notice when I use the two converging lenses, the, the focal length got shorter than what it was for just one lens alone. Hmm. Okay. So that's not by stronger, the focal length went down. Weird terminology. No, no op, uh, but in optics really, well. Uh, how can lenses, lenses be combined to make a weaker lens? Do you notice when I had the converging lens and I brought a deep diverging lens up, the focal length went longer. That's what he means by weaker. Uh, the stronger and weaker also to do with, well, yeah, that's other things. Uh, maybe biologists would, and doctors would talk about our eyes being stronger or weaker or something, I don't know. What was the critical angle in the place where we did the the D-shaped prism? Where we did the D-shaped prism. Okay. What do we find the critical angle to be? It was near close to something like 45 degrees, something like that. Then at the very next thing, we used a Forty-five, forty-five, ninety prism. Why did it act like a mirror? I said that earlier. Hmm. Total internal something. Oh, yeah, total internal reflection. The last question is: How did this, the the how did the calculated focal length of the lens in part ten compare to the measured focal length? Uh, uh, of the same lens in part 14, what it's talking about 10 and 14 in uh, <coughs> in uh, what they're calling 10 is where you do the thing we use the thin lens equation 1 over D0 DO plus 1 over DI is equal to 1 over the focal length and when it's saying part uh, 14 they're talking about, where's 14? They're talking about oh. Was there a part 14? I think it means part 4. Oh, that's what, that's what, I'm reading it wrong, wait. Yeah, part four, I'm reading it, I was doing the wrong thing. Part four is where we took parallel rays and put them into the converging lens to mean an option of infinity and saw where the image distance was, and that happened to be the focal length because the object was an infinity. So, one we did the option of infinity and found the focal length. The other one we did the thin lens equation. It says, how do they compare? They're kind of close. Okay. They didn't ask, but they could have asked, which one do you think is more precise? Wow. They didn't ask that, though. Okay. That is the ray tracing lab. It's not as much fun watching a video as when you're on the table and you take pencil out and you draw lines and you take and measure angles precise of the protractor because the lines of the pencil are thin, so you get very precise angle measurements. And you can get the lines to cross so you can get very really good length measurements and everything. And it's fun, it works, we're doing the lab in the dark.
We're here by turning lights on and off and on and off. But there's a ray tracing lab 